Not every church reaches that bicentenary time, and this is something for which to thank God Almighty. It reminds us of Christ Jesus himself who said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, there has been a fidelity with respect to the gospel here that um, has endured and flourished even when some churches have rather lost the gospel, and for this we ought to offer great thanksgiving to God. Now, this afternoon I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles or to turn on your Bibles, depending on how old you are, <laughs> to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, and I shall read from verse 16 to the end of the chapter. Acts 17, beginning at verse 16. Hear then what Holy Scripture says. While Paul was waiting for them, that is, for Silas and Timothy mentioned in the preceding verse, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So, you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him, though He is not far from any one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are His offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent. For He has set a day when He will judge the world with justice by the man He has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising Him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them were Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. This is the word of the Lord. Have you had experiences of... Um, almost flabbergasted shock. Uh, 
in the last 20 years when you've tried to bear witness to somebody and you have the distinct feeling they live on another planet? <laughs> Their categories are not yours and your categories are not theirs. A few years ago, one of the television channels asked me to go and do my evangelical leader thing. It was a program that they were doing on the life of Christ or something, and they, they wanted a token evangelical to contribute to the program. So I flew off to the city where the, uh, the shooting was taking place, and I, I was going to be there for, for three days, um, getting shot. Um, <laughs> And when it was all done, I think I had about nine seconds of airtime on the program. It really wasn't worth it, but you do your bit, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. I, I, I found the time most interesting. I think I spoke to everybody on the crew. There were about 40 on the crew, sound people and video people and light people and, and so on. Uh, there wasn't one who knew the Bible had two testaments. And then the, the wee chappy who picked me up in a limo. Now, I normally don't get limos. I mean, I, I didn't get one today. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not complaining. I'm, I'm just, I just don't want to give you a wrong impression of how used I am to, 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 to limos. But anyway, the, the, the chappy who, who drove this limo uh, uh, was a little silent, and I thought I'd, I'd feel him out a wee bit. And uh, how are things going with you? Oh, they could be better. I said, you want to talk about it? Well, he said, I have one daughter. Well, I had one daughter. She died three weeks ago. I said, I am so sorry. I don't mean to intrude, but if you'd like to talk about it, I'll, I'll be glad to listen. He said, well, sh she was 32. She'd only got married the year before. She lived in Kansas. She was happily married, but her four-wheel drive vehicle hit some ice and flipped. She died. I said to him, um, trying to find some way to get in here. You understand how you, you do that for love of Christ and love of the person. I said to him, would, would you view your wife, your, your daughter's death a little differently if you were utterly convinced that there's life after death? Oh, he said, I know just what you mean. I'm sure she'd like to come back and revisit her garden by, by returning as a butterfly. And I thought, whoa, there we go again. Zing, zing. We're not meeting, you know? In other words, we're living in a culture now that is so far removed from the categories that someone like me assumed, absorbed, received with his mother's milk. I still do university missions. I've been doing them for 45 years. The questions have changed. The assumptions have changed. The students have changed. Many things are similar, but some things are different. One of the things that's spectacularly different is the sheer biblical illiteracy. So the limited religious vocabulary of the non-believing students at the university missions I speak at, in every case, means something different from what I mean. God, faith, spirit, truth, Limited religious vocabulary, but whatever there is, they mean something different from what I mean. And you realize that part of the church's silence when it comes to aggressive evangelism today is because some of us are scared witless since we don't know what to say. How do you engage? There was a time when we knew what evangelism was. We were dealing with people who were more or less like us. They just needed to repent and believe. The content of that belief, in, in, in many, many respects, they, 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 they knew. They, they were brought up in Sunday school. So you had to stress certain things. You had to, you had to stress the substitutionary death of Christ and what, what is the cross work and the resurrection of Christ were really about. And they might be a little skeptical about those things, but if you could convince them, humanly speaking, that, that these things actually happened, you, you were, humanly speaking, 90% of the way towards seeing a conversion. <laughs> 
Nowadays, even if you could convince somebody that Jesus did rise from the dead, the first question is going to be, yeah, but what about all those Hindus? And you realize suddenly you're on another planet again. Now, what I want to make clear this afternoon is that this sense of cultural dislocation was already faced in the first century. And that brings us to the chapter we have before us. We'll address it with five points of unequal length. First, the situation Paul addresses. The situation Paul addresses. We discover that Paul arrives in Athens. As far as we know, this was his first trip there. Already the Parthenon, which you can still see today, had been up for 500 years. There was a sense of heritage and rootedness. Athens was still viewed. It was a bit in decline, but it was still viewed as the premier intellectual center of the world, followed closely by Alexandria and Egypt. And, and you would think that when he got there, he would be at least a little admiring of this great theological tradition, this great philosophical construction, this, this literary center of the universe. But no, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. In other words, he brings to his perception of the culture a God-given frame of reference by which he judges all things. He doesn't make notes about the spectacular glory of the Parthenon. Rather, he passes on notes to his dear friend Luke about how shocked he was by the degree of idolatry. Now, this Paul, of course, by this time, had had a lot of experience. So, he had preached, for example, in Acts chapter 13 in a synagogue in Pisidian Antioch. In, in this uh, synagogue, um, he, he was dealing with fellow Jews or he, he was dealing with Jewish proselytes, Gentile proselytes who were genuinely new Jews or God-fearers. And so they were used to the Old Testament and they shared a lot of theological convictions with the apostle. Both Paul and they believed there was only one God. Both Paul and they believed that salvation consists in being reconciled to this God. Both Paul and they had shared understanding of what sin is. It's, it's defiance against God. It's, it's, it's guilt that is incurred because of our rebellion. Both Paul and they had a vision of redemptive history that would bring you to the new heaven and the new earth, the home of righteousness and resurrection existence at the end. Both Paul and they understood there really was a difference between truth and error, between right and wrong. Both Paul and they understood the significance of blood sacrifice. They read the Old Testament. And some of them had gone up to Jerusalem at the time of, of Yom Kippur or at Passover to see the, the, the sacrifices being offered there based on Old Testament chapters like Leviticus 16 for Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The, 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 these were givens. So Paul spends no time on those things. None. Reread chapter 13, the longest sermon in the book of Acts. He spends no time on them because that's common ground. Where does he spend his time? In Acts 13, he spends his time on Jesus' identity and his death and resurrection. That's it. That's the new material. And it fits into the frame of reference that was already established in Paul's mind from his own theological training as a Jew and his own conversion experience and theological illumination uh, that he has received from the hand of God as a Christian and an apostle of the gospel of God. But now he's dealing with people where they don't believe in one God. They have very different ideas, conflicting ideas about uh, what salvation is. The word God itself has many possible meanings. And no really clear understanding of what sin is. I'll come to that again in a moment. And absolute conviction that there is not just one way to God. And, 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 and their religious vocabulary in every case means something different. Whereas they see lots and lots of gods in the city, Paul sees lots and lots of idols in the city. 
all damning. Same city, different cultural read. Where do you start? And I want to suggest to you, brothers and sisters, that at this point in Western culture, and in many other parts of the world too, but certainly in Western culture, one of our biggest challenges is facing the sheer biblical illiteracy of the age and how to bear witness effectively granted that biblical illiteracy. Moreover, it's not just biblical illiteracy in the sense that people don't know things, but otherwise they're a tabula rasa, a, a, a blank hard drive. All you've got to do is fill in the good data and it'll all come out right. Rather, instead, they have their own religions. The hard drive, their hard drives are all filled up with other things. We're told about some of them, the Epicurean philosophers, the Stoic philosophers. They had their own philosophies, their, their own religions, and these philosophies and religions left little place for a Christian view. In fact, they were contradicted by the Christian view. Epicureans, well, they had a philosophy that said the ideal was an undisturbed life. They, they held that the gods were made up of atoms so fine, so small, that they lived in the spaces between the atoms of this world. And the ideal of an undisturbed life was not to be bothered with the stuff that goes, all on, goes on all around you. The gods are nicely removed from the hurly-burly of life, so human beings should seek the same ideal. But over against that, Paul presents a God who is actively involved in this world as its creator, its providential ruler, its judge, and its redeemer. No removal at all. And the Stoics, well... Stoic philosophy thought of God in yet another way, as sort of all-pervasive, to be identified as the divine or as reason. It wasn't quite clear which it was. Human ideal was to live life in line with what is ultimately real, to conduct li life in line with this reasonable godishness. It was marked by great moral earnestness and a high sense of duty and a deep suspicion of the passions. But over against such a vision, Paul presents a God who, far from being pantheistic, connected somehow irretrievably with the whole of reality. This God is personal. He's distinct from the creation. He holds the creation to account. He is our final judge. Instead of thinking that salvation is, is tied up with universal reason tapped into by human reasoning, Paul contrasts divine will and sovereignty and the need for revelation if we're to find salvation anywhere. The worldviews are entirely different. Do you, do, do you see? So likewise today, we would probably not begin by saying, I see that in every way you are very religious, which is what Paul says. That'll not earn you many brownie points. <laughs> what you would say today is, I, I see that in many ways you are very spiritual. Well, everybody likes to be spiritual today. It doesn't mean a blessed thing, but it's, it's all right if you call people spiritual. And then you can actually give some signs of it. If people are a bit tired of the, of the reductionistic mechanism of a Dawkins or something. They want something more than that. But oh, the alienation, the alienation. This is the situation Paul addresses. Number two the stance that Paul adopts. He reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks. That is, he began his evangelism by appealing to those who have some biblical theological background. Just as today, you might want to do some of your basic initial evangelism with people who have a churchy background, people who did go to Sunday school, people who made a profession of faith that never really stuck, people who have a fine Catholic catechetical background but don't really understand the gospel. They're, they're part of the heritage somehow, the heritage of Christendom. And there are some of those people around. How many of those people there are depends on where you are in North America. There are some places where they're thick on the ground and other places where they're hard to find. But it's in some ways easier to get into a conversation with those people because you're on roughly the same sort of terrain, do you see? And so he does what he always does to the Jew first then also to the Greeks is his philosophy articulated in Romans. And, and so he, he goes to the synagogue. 
and he, he reasons and he argues. And, and there you're going to hear him saying the kinds of things that he says in Acts chapter 13. And then we're told, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happen to be there. He went into the public arena, what is sometimes called today the naked public square. He engaged with people. Now, I cannot stress this strongly enough. He, he doesn't simply have synagogue meetings and hope that the odd unbeliever will come in. Hold synagogue meetings and hope that some of the believers will invite in a pagan now and then. He finds venues. He finds contexts where he will be dealing with people who don't know anything about anything that he thinks is important. I cannot say this strongly enough. You cannot possibly win contemporary nons. You cannot possibly win contemporary skeptics unless you love them, unless you like to talk with them, unless you go to their way to find places where you have a coffee together. And neighbors who are gay, take them over for coffee, for goodness sake, get to know them. How on earth can you win anybody to Christ unless you know them and love them and talk with them? And that's what Paul is doing. The marketplace was not just the place where you bought stuff and sold stuff. It was the place where ideas were batted around, a bit like Hyde Park in London. It was, it was the place where there was a public conversation, a, a, a chat program on television, whatever. He's not afraid to engage. And in the engaging, he finds out, steered by God, from his own study, from his own experience, more and more and more what he must get across, what must be said. This is the stance that Paul adopts. He has a clear mental vision of the lostness of people with a churchified background or a Jewish synagogue background, and he goes after them with the gospel, but he also goes after those who don't know anything about this background. The people, the scholars in the Areopagus almost certainly would not have heard of Moses. Or if they had heard about them because of their interactions with Jews in the community, they wouldn't have read Moses. They wouldn't have read what we call the Old Testament. And if they had, I don't know what they would have made of it. It, 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 it was an alien world. Do, 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 do you see? And hence the sneering condescension. Uh, well, he seems to be talking about foreign gods. He, you can hear the arrogance dripping from their lips as they just sneer and, and dismiss this rubbish. And what is the rubbish that Paul is preaching? Well, we're told, verse 18, it, Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. That is, he was preaching the gospel. That's what the word is. He was preaching the gospel and the resurrection. And, and it struck these people in the first instance as silliness, just nonsense. So here is the stance that Paul adopts. We need to become more and more aware of the sheer lostness of our world. More than 60 years ago, Yeats wrote the famous lines, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is, law, is loosed upon the world. What he's saying is that the, the cultural heritage of the impact of, of confessional Christianity from centuries past has, has been etched away. There's, there's nothing there. There's no center that holds the culture together anymore. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is damned. The best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Doesn't that feel like Canada and the U.S. in 2020? The best lack all conviction, and the worst are full of passionate intensity, with no center anywhere. Now where do you start? Which brings us to the third heading. 
the message Paul preaches. The text reminds us that it's not just that they were Epicureans or Stoics or, for that matter, other groups, but that they were intellectually curious. They, they had a fetish of listening to new things. I've been on enough university campuses in the last half century to think that's a pretty good description of senior common rooms I've been in. The foreigners lived there, spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Sounds like our news programs. And Paul begins, I see that in every way you are very spiritual. That's a slight paraphrase, but you get the idea. He makes a connection. But then the connection is turned on a dime. As I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, the particular word that is used there is a Pauline coinage. I don't know how you translate it. Objects of worship isn't bad. Little idols. It's not an insult, but it's, 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 it's not submitting to them as true gods at all. I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Paul takes that to be a mark of confession of their ignorance. So what you proudly boast that you don't know, I'm going to talk to you about. Let me introduce you to God. It's wonderful. Don't you imagine that in the Areopagus at this point every ear is tingling, everybody's listening? Earlier they were dismissing the man as a, a babbler, the ideas of someone who, who picks up a seed here and a, a, another little pebble here and d doesn't have any good integration, doesn't put them together. and It's just a jumble of silly ideas. There's no rigorous philosophy, no, no structured stoicism, structured epicureanism, structured anything. It's just, it's just rubbish. And Paul is saying, mm, nope. Your own systems of worship have led you to confess your ignorance. I'm going to clean up your ignorance. There's a certain quiet confidence in there that is just shy of being rude, but is boldly confessional, too. And so he begins. The first thing he establishes is the uniqueness and power and independence of God. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. Now, you can read this sermon in about two minutes. But when Paul gave the original Adiopagus address, each of these clauses was doubtless one point. Adiopagus addresses were not finished in two minutes. They went on for hours. If we had the full script, I'm sure that each of these clauses would be one whole point that may have gone on for five minutes or ten minutes or fifteen minutes. What are you going to do with the God who made the world and everything in it? Doctrine of creation and everything in it. No division between the material order and the immaterial order. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He's not only the creator but he's the sovereign. Do you realize how many pagan ideas that's overthrowing? Some Greeks at the time thought that this created order, this material world, was made by a lesser God. It couldn't be by the supreme God since the supreme God would not soil himself with, ma with matter. So m maybe he made lesser gods who made lesser gods who made lesser gods until you finally got a low enough God who actually made this physical world. Some thought along those lines. Paul undercuts the whole lot. The God I'm talking about made everything in heaven and on earth, material and immaterial. He made the whole lot, and he's still in charge of the whole lot. He still rules the whole lot, and you're accountable to him. Do you realize what is being established here? It's a frame of reference. Do you ever, do you ever have occasions when you're talking to someone at work? You're, you're sharing your faith. You're, you're trying to be winsome. You, you play honestly at work and, and so on, but eventually somebody turns on you and says, look, your endless talk about Jesus is driving me nuts. You, you, you know, we're, we, we've all got our spiritual paths. I've got my way of being spiritual, and for you, your way of being spiritual is Jesus. Fine. If that works for you, I'm not criticizing. I just want you to stop shoving your Jesus down my throat. 
What do you say? Well, it, it may be that you have been a little aggressive. Maybe you have to back off a bit and go into a cooking class with them or <laughs> go fishing or be friendly, go for coffee. Starbucks isn't all bad for evangelism. But sooner or later, don't you have to say something like this? I really don't mean to be rude. I don't mean to be offensive. But the one thing I can't do is keep quiet about Jesus. Amen. Be because you see, this God made you. And because he made you, you owe him. And because you owe him, he holds you to account and will judge you on the last day. I'm doing you a favor by talking to you about him. If, 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 I, if I shut up about him, I'm leaving you in huge danger. Don't you see that? Don't you have to say something like that somewhere along the line? That's why you establish the doctrine of creation. The doctrine of creation in the first instance is not something to fight over young earth versus old earth. It's the godness of God, the creator, ruler, sovereignty, accountability of his creatures to him, God. It's, it's, it's this whopping big picture that establishes the nature of God's relationship to the entire universe. That's the first instance. I'm not saying the other things can't be argued about, but they're not of first importance. Then he goes on. He does not live in a temple built by human hands. Well, Paul, haven't you heard of the Solomon's temple? I mean, wasn't God there living in a temple made of human hands? But, but you see, what Paul is trying to contradict is, is not the fact that God chose to manifest his presence in the tabernacle and later in the Solomonic temple and after the exile in a rebuilt temple. It's, it, he's not denying any of that history. He's denying the pagan view of temples in which this was sacred space where gods were located. And in these sacred spaces where gods were located and in some ways limited, the priests had special magic insight, spiritual insight, so that if you wanted something from these gods, you offered sacrifices and paid some monies to the clergy, the pagan priests, and, 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 and you, you, you hoped to arrange things so that the god would give you a, a blessing back. It was a kind of tit-for-tat arrangement. That's the way it is in all pagan religion, without exception. The gods are finite. They have their own domains. There's no one god. There's a God who will govern whether or not you've had a, 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 a good voyage uh, when you're crossing the Mediterranean. That God is called Neptune, the God of the sea. And, and th there are gods that, that will determine whether or not you'll make a fine speech in the Roman Senate. Uh, in, in, the, in the Latin world, Mercury. In the Greek world, it's Hermes, the God of communication. If you're going off to have struggle with, with, with a, a neighbor and you, you want to win in a conflict, uh, you want Zeus on side. And you're going to fall in love, make sure you offer some sacrifice to Venus and so on. And there were thousands of these gods. No wonder they wanted to make sure they hadn't left one out and offer a sacrifice to an unknown god just for a little bit of extra insurance. And all of the arrangement is you offer the sacrifice, you get something back. You offer the sacrifice, you get something tit for tat, tit for tat, tit for tat. That's pagan religion. No wonder people live their lives in fear. But this god is not restricted to temples manipulated by priests. Paul knew very well what Solomon prayed at the dedication of the temple. Behold, the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. Not only so, but he goes on to say, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. The Puritans had a word for this that we've lost from the English language. We need to restore it. He's the God of aseity, A-S-E-I-T-Y. It's from the Latin ase. He is from himself. That is, he's not dependent on any other. He's from himself. He's the God of aseity. He doesn't need anything, not a thing. Sometimes we who confess the name of Christ in the evangelical heritage get that wrong. We, we, we think that somehow what we're doing as we come up to worship is giving something that God needs. But it's not as if God gets to Thursday afternoon and starts saying, oh, I can hardly wait till Sunday when they break out those guitars <laughs> or let loose in the pipe organ. <laughs> <laughs> 
I feel so much better when they're singing my praise. You know what? He doesn't need your praise. Doesn't need a thing. In eternity past, he was perfectly happy without people singing praises. In eternity past, the Father loved the Son and the Son loved the Father and their life as the Godhead was complete. Now, don't misunderstand me. That does not mean that God does not demand our praise or want the praise. I could give you a long paragraph or two on why God wants this praise. It's, it's not because he's insecure. It, it, it's, it's not because he is, he is agitated because he's being left out. No, 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 no. There, there are good and godly and loving reasons why he demands the praise, and this is part of his choice and his self-declaration and his self-revelation to his people. But it's not because he needs it. It's not because there's some deficiency in him which we make up. But that's the way tit-for-tat religion works. God's got his needs, and we offer something, and if we offer enough of the right things, then he'll meet our needs. Uh, God, if I have my devotions every day for at least half an hour for a whole year, will you give me a nice baby? God help us. Pagan rubbish. Do you, do you see? It's treating God as if he, the poor chap needs something. But the God we are dealing with is bigger than that. He's the God of aseity. He doesn't need anything. In fact, all the needs go the other way. Paul says, he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. How do you arrange to have a tit-for-tat relationship with a God who doesn't need a blessed thing? The only way you can deal with this God is if he's gracious. Otherwise, you don't have a prayer. You can't give him anything except your need and your shame and your guilt, except your faith and your repentance. And that's not contributing to him. It's merely establishing the only possible relationship you can have with a holy, infinite, sovereign, compassionate God. And then he goes on from the doctrine of God to the doctrine of creation. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. So he's not just a tribal deity. Tribal deities were everywhere in the pagan world. Very few people thought of one God as God over all. But this is an insight that comes from Genesis 1, for goodness sake. It's endemic to Old Testament religion. He may be the God of Israel because of his covenantal choices and his gracious self-disclosure to a certain people, but it's not because he's the Israelite tribal God oh, as opposed to the Edomite tribal God who is equally valid but just for the Edomites. Do you see? This is not a Western God. This is not a white God. This is not a rich God. This is not an intellectual God. He's just God, the only God. And there's no hint anywhere of tribalism or racism or racial superiority in this simple confession. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and boundaries of their lands. He's sovereign over the whole lot for their history as well as of the Israelite history. Do you know he's sovereign over Chinese history and Canadian history? Albanian history. I've just come back from Africa. You know what? He's sovereign over Kikuyu history, and Kamba history, and Zulu history. The one God. To build any sort of racism out of this is just an abomination before the Almighty. It's denying that He's one God. Moreover, God sovereignly appointed things so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For the first time, you're beginning to see, it's not laid out clearly yet, 
you're beginning to see that the human race is lost. So far, we've had the doctrine of creation, but not the doctrine of the fall. The doctrine of creation, but not the doctrine of lostness. In other words, the fact that God arranges things sovereignly so that perhaps some will seek Him already suggests that they're lost. They need to seek Him. They're already alienated. Do, do, do you see? And God is arranging things in His compassion so that some perhaps will seek Him. Though at one level, He's, he's not hard to find. He's, he's not only the sovereign transcendent God above space and time, He's the sovereign immanent God. He's not far from every one of us, He says. So you're getting more about God, more about history, more of a philosophy of, of culture and of, of God's sovereignty over uh, the individual tribe and the individual person. And even some pagans have had that insight right. Verse 28. And now we get into sin much more robustly. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone an image made by human design and skill. You might think, why doesn't he talk about moral issues? Far too much sexualism in this culture. Far too much homosexuality in the ancient Roman world. Far too much rape by Roman soldiers. Far too much corruption in the corridors of power. Why doesn't he deal with those kinds of things? Why don't people speak the truth a bit more? God expects us to tell the truth. In fact, what he focuses on instead is idolatry. The Old Testament alone speaks of the wrath of God about 600 times. Overwhelmingly, the thing that triggers God's wrath in the Old Testament is idolatry. It is the quintessential defining sin. It degods God. It is the breaking of the most important commandment to love God with heart and soul and mind and strength, and of the second commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. I've often pointed out that David comes to understand this after his sin with Bathsheba and her husband Uriah the Hittite. He's eventually confronted by Nathan the prophet and is led to deep, deep repentance. And as a result of his repentance, he writes Psalm 51, penned in the aftermath. And one of the things he says in his prayer addressed to God in the aftermath of these wretched sins and his own repentance is this, against you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Psalm 51, 4. Now, at one level, you want to say, come on, David, pull the other one. You've only sinned against God? Doesn't that make things just too private? Gets you off the hook? Didn't you sin against Bathsheba? You seduced her. Didn't you sin against Uriah the Hittite? You had him bumped off, for goodness sake. Didn't you sin against your military high command? You corrupted them. Didn't you sin against your family? You betrayed them. Didn't you sin against the whole nation as the chief magistrate? You're supposed to uphold. You. Is there anybody you haven't sinned against, David? And you have the cheek to sit there and write against you only have I sinned. All pious God talk, that is. Except at the most profound level, it's the truth. Because what makes sin sin is that it's offense against God. Oh, the Bible is concerned for social inequities. The Bible is concerned with cruelty and war. The Bible is concerned with rape and injustice and oppression of the poor and so on. The Bible deals with all of those kinds of things. But overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, the sin against which the Bible speaks most forcefully and repeatedly that attracts the wrath of God is idolatry. The reason why the first commandment, the greatest commandment, is the greatest commandment is because it's the one sin you always commit. It's the one commandment you always break if you break any other. And if you kept that one commandment, you never commit any other. 
What makes evil evil in the first instance is that it defies God, it de-gods God, it's, it's idolatry. You've got, you've got something in the, in the place of God. And if God gets back into that place where God alone is God, then the sin goes. So Paul deals with a root sin, idolatry. The problem with your religion, he says, is you got wrong pictures of God. They're too small. They're too controlled. They're too created. They're too weak. They're too ignorant. They're too useless. They're just images of gold and silver. And you can hear in his mind what he's thinking about biblically. You want to know what he's thinking about biblically? Go home tonight, get on your knees and read Psalm, read Isaiah 40 to 45. That's what he's thinking about. These powerful images of a God who knows the end from the beginning and who, unlike the pagan gods, sees everything, knows everything, controls everything. In another connection, in another country, I was reading these words just the other night. Psalm, uh, uh, Isaiah 41. Present your case, says the Lord. Set forth your arguments, says Jacob's king. Tell us, you idols, what is going to happen. Tell us what the former things were, so that we may consider them and know their final outcome. Or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds, so that we may know that you are gods. Do something, whether good or bad, so that we will be dismayed or filled with fear. But you are less than nothing. Your works are utterly worthless. Whoever chooses you is detestable. And he goes on, I looked, but there was no one, no one among the gods to give counsel, no one to give answer when I asked them. See, they're all false. Their deeds amount to nothing. Their images are but wind and confusion. Paul rails against idolatry. It's the fundamental sin that has to be addressed. Then he introduces salvation history. There are a lot of people in the ancient world who think that history goes around and around in circles, like a lot of modern-day Hindus. What goes around comes around. It goes around in circles again and again and again. Or some think that it's just uh, there in a, in a flat plane which goes on forever. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there's a beginning in creation. And there's a consummation with a, a new heaven and a new earth, a home of righteousness. And there are certain redemptive appointments along the line, supremely the coming of Christ. So look what he says. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, which presupposes that now he's not overlooking it. There's something new that's happened. I'm about to tell you something spectacular that God has done that has changed the times, he says. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Now he is covering all a lot of Jewish history, instead of the locus of the people of God being the Israelites, now he's commanded all people everywhere to repent. He's got a vision of a church made up of men and women from every tongue and tribe and people and nation. And for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice. That's the end. So we have creation. Now a certain thing has happened and, and we're rushing toward a final judge, a, a final judgment, and, 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 and that's bound up with, with a new heaven and a new earth at the end when God will judge the world with righteousness and he's going to do this by a man he's appointed and for the first time he introduces Jesus. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And now you're into the gospel story. And if you want to know what Paul would have done if he hadn't been interrupted... he would have talked about the gospel. Because after, after all, that's what he was doing back in verse 18, wasn't it? Paul was preaching the gospel about Jesus and the resurrection. But he recognizes that their frame of reference, their worldview is so alien that they've got to set up the storyline of the Bible. They've got to set up the worldview of the Bible. They've got to set up something about God and judgment and sin and righteousness and so on to make the relevance of Jesus clear. Do you see? This is the message Paul preaches. Far more briefly, the results that Paul achieves, we're told that when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this matter. That Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, and a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. 
Have you heard the interpretation that says, actually, in Acts 17 in Athens, Paul made a big mistake? Have you heard that interpretation? What they say is, back in Acts 13, Paul just preached Jesus and his cross work and his resurrection, but here he goes all philosophical, he goes all worldview-ish. But he made a mistake. After all, a few people believed, we're told. Nothing like Pentecost. Nothing like the great numbers in Ephesus. A few people believed. That's what happens when you all go philosophical on us. Not only so, but after this, Paul writes to the Corinthians, the next stop after Athens. And he said, when I was among you, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I resolved to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I resolved to get back to the gospel. So, Don, what you're really telling us in this sermon is to do all the stuff that Paul himself repudiated. Now, with all due respect to those who take this view, it's dead wrong. What, what can, I, can I make it clearer than that? I mean, <laughs> l- 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 let me t- give you eight or nine reasons why it's dead wrong. And the, the reason it's important to know that it's dead wrong is so that you don't make the same mistake. It's, it's not a question of a, a, a small difference that has no bearing on anything. If, if you really think that Paul made a mistake, then you will learn nothing from what he said, you, except to reject it. First, to appeal to 1 Corinthians 2, I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified, is to inject into Acts something that's not in Acts. The natural reading of Acts is that this was another sign of gracious triumph in the preaching of the gospel. A small sign to a small crowd, but a real sign. Number two, Acts 17, the sermon content, is entirely in line with Paul's own theology in Romans. If I had time, I could show you that every one of his major points is something that Paul deals with at much greater length in Romans and elsewhere in his writings. This is not Paul going off track. Think of what Paul says about the importance of creation in in, in Romans 1, 2, and 3 creation, fall, the nature of idolatry, the lostness of the human race, and so on. All of those things are what Paul believes and teaches. Number three, despite some of our English translations, the text does not say that only a few believed, some older versions say that, but certain people believed and others did not. But, number four, transparently, Paul was cut off. And we know what he would have said because of 1718. He preached the gospel. That's that's what he was doing. Moreover, at this juncture, Paul was not a rookie. It's not as if he just got out of seminary about six months earlier and was still a bit intimidated and made mistakes. At this point in his ministry, at this time when he's preaching in Athens, he's been in the ministry for 25 years plus. He's not intimidated by a few intellectuals. He's been beaten up, shipwrecked. He's been bruised. He's been battered with robs, rods. He's been flagellated in Jewish synagogues. He's connected with intellectuals before in some of the cities of Asia Minor. It, it, it's, it's not as if he gets to Athens and thinks, oh boy, I've got to be intellectual. Um, I, I'm going to sacrifice my entire theological heritage. Um, he, he's a mature man of tested and proven theological commitments. To imagine at this point that Paul is scared witless just doesn't make sense. Moreover, in 1 Corinthians 2, when Paul does say, I determine to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified, he does not set that resolution against his experience a few weeks earlier in Athens. He sets it over against instead what some people call the Corinthian rhetorical tradition. That is, in Corinth, they had lots and lots and lots of admiration for people with great rhetoric and powerful speech and flourishes, and voices that knew how to rise and fall, and were mellifluously deep. It was part of the rhetorical tradition when Paul, over against all that, says, not when I was there, I, I was determined instead to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He was suspicious of eloquence that moved people but didn't convert people. That's what he's fighting for in 1 Corinthians 2. And in any case, number eight, In 2 Corinthians 10, written still later, Paul still sees that it is important to bring every thought into obedience to Christ. And in the context, that does not mean 
don't watch porn, get every thought obedient to Christ. And the context is every worldview, every frame of reference, every way of thinking, bring it all under obedience to Christ. He's still thinking worldviewishly, do you see? And moreover, there's another element here that I didn't understand myself until a few years ago. We're told in verse 34 that some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. When I was a young man and was doing university missions, if some people got converted, they were converted during the week when I was doing the mission. But as I've been preaching in recent years to people who are farther and farther removed from Christian heritage, who are more and more biblically literate, I spend more and more in my time trying to build up the background and so on. And one of the things I try to get done by the end of the mission is to get people signed on to Bible studies so that people tend to get converted in the weeks and months after the mission in the evangelistic Bible studies. Do you, do you see? In other words, what happens is these people become followers of Don and then believed. That's exactly what is happening here. They wanted to hear him again on this matter, so some became followers of Paul. And in consequence, in time, believed. You're not supposed to read this, they became followers of Paul and believed at the end of that sermon. It doesn't say that. In other words, when people come from a background that is so bone ignorant about the basics of the Bible, it may take time. Don't misunderstand me. God can save anybody in 15 minutes if he wants to, or two seconds. I, I, I'm not prescribing a limitation on God, but God is normally a God of means, and this God of means wants the Bible to be explained and understood, the structure of things to be in place so that you understand what Jesus does, what he accomplishes, what sins he is addressing, and so forth. Well, enough of that excursus. Those are the results that Paul achieves. Now let me conclude with one or two practical implications. Number one, we must be intentional about evangelizing biblical illiterates. We mustn't restrict ourselves only to the churchified. Number two, where there is biblical illiteracy, we must start back farther. In other words, we cannot assume that they are already at the Old Testament stage. The reason we must start farther back is that the biblical context, who Jesus is and what he's done, is necessary for understanding the atonement, the nature of saving faith, what sin is, why God is angry, where we're heading in history. All of those things need to be in place to understand how absolutely precious and utterly unavoidable King Jesus is. Nowadays, there are some helps along these lines. The forms of evangelism that I grew up with, with, with as a boy basically assumed a great deal. Now things like Vaughn Roberts' little book that surveys the whole Bible in 140 pages, I tried to do something myself in a book called The God Who Is There that takes you through the whole Bible in 14 chapters. You need to get people into Bible study so as to see how the Bible itself is put together. And within that framework, preach Jesus. Preach Jesus. Preach Jesus. Let us pray. Help us, Lord God, we beg of you to persevere intentionally in our evangelism, loving men and women who don't know anything about the Bible, but who need to hear what sin is, who you are, what judgment consists in, the destiny of history, and within that framework to learn that there is a wonderful Savior who bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Give us, we pray, courage to start explaining these things to friends and learning by their questions what to say, becoming faithful as Paul was faithful in Athens to speak not only to synagogue folk but also to the pagans who happen to be there. Have mercy on this land, we pray. Have mercy on this church in downtown Toronto at a time when so few people have Christian roots anymore. Grant that there may come upon this church a mighty burden to evangelize, to evangelize, to evangelize effectively, faithfully, 
wisely, insistently. And then will you not rend the heavens and come down and show yourself afresh to men and women and bring them to saving faith? We beg these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen.